Yeah. Right, so uh, after a uh, short summer break, welcome to the second half of the Austrian Research Institute for Artificial Intelligence's 2022 lecture series. Um, my name is uh, Tristan Miller. I'm a research scientist here. And uh, it's my pleasure uh, this evening to welcome uh, a colleague of mine, uh, whom I knew uh, back when we were both working at the Technische Universität in Darmstadt. Um, he's uh, Stefan Egger. Uh, he was an independent research group leader at Taylor Darmstadt, uh, and before that, a postdoc at the Goethe Universität in Frankfurt. Um, but now is serving as a stand-in professor at uh, Bielefeld University. Uh, he holds a prestigious Heisenberg grant from the German Research Foundation, and his research interests are in natural language processing, and particularly in evaluation metrics for text generation systems, as well as topics at the intersection of NLP, the computational social sciences, and the digital humanities. So I hope you'll all uh, Join me in uh, welcoming Stefan Egger uh, to the lecture series. He's going to be speaking on the topic of text generation for the humanities. And I would also ask that you hold your questions until the end of the talk. Thank you. Take it away, Stefan. All right. Thank you very much, Tristan. Um, yeah. So. My internet is not too stable, so I think I will uh, turn off the um, the uh, video if you don't mind. Um, and yeah, then thank you again for the nice introduction and I'll start right away with uh, text generation for the humanities. So um, the insight is that text generation has become ubiquitous in the last couple of years. So we see very high quality machine translation, summarization systems, dialogue, chatbot systems, image captioning systems, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the, reason, uh, that, um, the reason is that natural language generation has made enormous progress and become very popular. And this is mostly due to better architectures. So nowadays we have the transformer models, uh, which, which are very high quality models. Uh, they're also efficient models, so they can be pre-trained um, on a lot of data like web scale data, and you can make them larger and larger. And there's also better, better hardware, GPUs, TPUs, so as a consequence of all of this, we have seen that uh, text generation models have become better and better in the last few years. So there's, for example, uh, the GPT model series, GPT, GPT-2, GPT-3, that has been published last few years and has become larger and larger uh, with, very, um, with very astonishing performances. Uh, in this year, we've also seen the pathway language model by Google, which has been trained on 6,000 uh, TPUs and really achieves very astonishing results. So just to give you a glimpse of what these uh, natural language generation, those text generation models are capable of. So you can, for example, give them a prompt here. This is like a fictitious prompt about Edward Snowden having become president of the United States. And then those models will continue your initial story uh, with a lot of coherence along uh, long passages of text. So this is really uh, quite um, quite astonishing and um, unprecedented uh, uh, compared to what we've seen in, let's say, five, six, seven years back. Uh, this palm language model uh, is even more impressive. So if it has been uh, fine-tuned on, on data, for example, to explain a joke, then you can give it a new joke and it will explain you why this is actually funny. Or you can ask it questions that require logical inference and is able to answer the question and also give you the reasoning steps. So these are all very impressive um, improvements that these natural language generation models have seen in the last few years. <laughs> So now in my work, I want to present you our ongoing work. So none of this has been published, but it's all work in progress. 
on applying those text generation models to humanity's problems. And I'm going to talk about three such problems. The first one being abstract to title generation, where we have a scientific abstract and want to generate the title uh, from the abstract. And we also want to, um, or additionally, we want to uh, generate humorous title. And this is like joint work with my students, Yixian Xi and Yan Ran Chen. Then in the second part, I will talk about poetry generation, uh, which is uh, joint work with my uh, student Jonas Beluadi. And finally, I talk about cross-lingual, cross-temporal summarization, which is joint work with uh, my student Jihad Oni. All right, so let's start out with abstract to title generation, where, as I said, we have an abstract and we want to uh, of a scientific paper and we want to generate the title to it. All right, so to give some motivating story for this, um, I can say that automizing the scientific progress is interesting and it's also, it can also be controversial. For example, one or two years back, there has been a paper from the group of Graham Newbig who asked whether, uh, whether scientific reviewing can be automized. So this is, of course, very interesting application of natural language processing or natural language generation system. So they will automatically generate a review and maybe also the scores for you and which could also be seen as um, well as a, a very um, important help for the reviewing process, which suffers from exploding um, submission numbers, low review quality. So this is uh, an interesting, though controversial use case. So now in our case, we're, we're slightly less controversial. We only want to generate a title, but I argue that generating titles is already important because the title is the first access point to a paper. So having a good title is probably important so that other people can find your research. And there's also a lot of ongoing uh, research on uh, whether um, what uh, not only ongoing, but also past research on the relationship between the title and the citation counts of papers. So for those reasons, as uh, generating a title can be interesting and beneficial. Good. So what are our research questions? So among our research questions are, for example, do the state of the art text generation models produce better titles than humans? Um, can we automatically, automatically generate humorous titles? So this could be an additional research question. And here the rationale also being that maybe if a title is funny, then it also could attract more citations. So there's also ongoing research on this, whether humorous title have more citations. Uh, another question is, of course, how do we evaluate our systems? So um, both automatically and using humans. So how can we know whether our, our systems actually produce good titles? So those are just three research questions that we can think of in this context. All right, so let me tell you what we have done so far. So first step is we collect data. So we have collected 10,000 plus papers from the ACL anthology. So ACL anthology is a place that hosts all the um, important conferences from the natural language processing community. Um, so I'm, um, yeah, so this is the community that I feel is uh, associated with. So uh, this is why we had to focus on, uh, um, on the ACL anthology and the conferences that are included in the ACL anthology are EMLP, ACL knuckle. So you have all the top conferences included there, and we uh, extract, uh, as I said, ten thousand plus paper from this um, from this um, from this um, anthology. Secondly, we consider machine learning papers. Here again, we collect about ten thousand plus papers from, let's say, the most prestigious conferences such as NeurIPS, iClear, Triple AI, etc. So okay, so this is the one part. We have the data, and then we also need models. And we basically uh, we basically um, trained six state of the art natural language uh, generation systems on the task. So here are the names of those: GPT-2, Bart Base, Bart CNN, Bart Exam, T5 Small, Pegasus Exam. So I'm not going into the details of those text generation models. Let me just point out that they have all been considered state of the of the art in the last two to three years. Um, they are basically all transformer-based models, so you know that, uh, or you may know that transformers are the uh, successors of recurrent neural networks, uh, which uh, 
undo the recurrent relation and instead uh, use attention and it can be pre-trained on a lot of data and they, uh, that's where they acquire their high quality from. So we use those models. Uh, the differences between those models are in modeling frameworks. For example, some of those models are decoder only models, other, other uh, other models are encoder, decoder, but more important than this is the data sets on which they have been fine-tuned. For example, this BART exam here has been fine-tuned on summarization data sets. So summarization can be considered a good pre-train or a good fine-tuning task because abstract to title generation is similar to summarization. All right, so now that we have data, and that we have models, we have of course trained our models on the data and then the models generate titles given an abstract. So the next step is how do we evaluate our generated titles using humans and we have a first human evaluation that targets the quality of the generated titles. And how do we do this? We had about 10 students and one scientist plus one person from a, a crowdsourcing platform uh, in this, uh, among this crowd, among those uh, human annotators, were only one senior researcher. So myself, I was included as a senior researcher, and this also means that um, probably our annotation is not an expert annotation because most of those annotators were only bachelor or master students, which have which have not yet, uh, who have not yet written a lot of papers. So. This is a downside of our human uh, annotation study or human evaluation study that we have only one expert in our team. So what we did is we annotated 230 abstracts. Um, each abstract had six candidate generated titles. So we used randomly five out of our six systems to generate a title for the abstract. And so we had five candidate generated titles plus the original human title. So then the task was for our human annotators to select the two best and the two worst titles. And we use this preference uh, type of annotation because it has been shown to be um, more consistent, to lead to more consistent results. Um, it has also been shown to be more efficient and also, um, yeah, circumvent problems of Likert scale annotation such as, uh, yeah, that different annotators may have different interpretation of the scoring range. So this preference-based annotation is overall considered to be more consistent and reliable. So that's why we chose it for our task. The cost of annotation was about 30 to probably more towards 60 minutes for a batch of 10 abstracts. So overall, the annotation cost for one annotator was about um, up to 24 hours. All right, so here is an illustration of our uh, annotation procedure and to make this talk slightly interactive, I would, I could even, um, yeah, we could even do this interactively. So I would now read out the abstract to you and we can just quickly, um, you could just quickly um, select the two best titles, the abstract. Uh, so that we have a little bit of interaction. So, but let, let me first try, read out the abstract. So the abstract is, in this paper, we propose a computational method for determining the orthographic similarity between Romanian and related languages. We account for etymons and cognates, and we investigate not only the number of related work, words, but also their forms, quantifying orthographic similarities. The method we propose is adaptable to any language, as far as resources are available. Now the six titles uh, that are generated, five of which are generated by a text generation system and one of which is the human title are, um, are. The first one is a computational method for estimating orthographic similarity between Romanian and related languages. An etymological approach to cross-language orthographic similarity application on Romanian a computational method for measuring orthographic similarity between Romanian and related languages, a computational method for identifying orthographic similarity in Romanian, adaptive orthographic similarity measures for related languages, a computational method for the extraction of etymons and cognon, orthographic similarity of related languages, a computa computational approach. And now if it works, I would, let me see, I would make a survey if I see the survey.
Where is the survey? Okay, I don't see the survey. Just a second. So for some reason, usually I see a survey here in my in my um, Zoom, but now it's not here. I don't know, do I have to share, uh, stop sharing? Okay, for some reason it doesn't work. So, okay, let's let's skip this. So in any case, uh, even though it doesn't work, um, our human annotators would have to choose uh, would have to choose the two best titles and the two worst titles. Yeah. 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 yeah, bin ich, bin ich. So, yeah, okay, so there's maybe someone not muted. Okay, so I continue. Good, so we have this preference-based annotation. After having the preference-based annotation, what we do is uh, we convert the preference scores to continuous scores because those continuous scores are just much easier to work with and it's also standard in downstream task. So we want to have uh, continuous scores instead of preferences. And we use a standard formula to convert the preferences into continuous scores and this standard formula is, so for each abstract title pair, uh, we let's say we have n annotators and then we make our formula as the number of annotators that have selected uh, the current title as the best title minus the number of annotators that have selected the current title as the worst title divided by the number of annotators. All right, so this is the quality annotation. Now let's talk about the humor annotation. So this is the second part of our annotation. So we want to identify humorous titles from our data so that later on we can also generate humorous, humor, humorous title on demand. For example, we could feed in the abstract and in addition to the abstract, a flag, whether or, the, whether or not the title is supposed to be humorous. And then we hope that our system will either produce a humorous title or not a humorous title. So for this task, we had two annotators, and instead of having a binary annotation, funny or not, we had three labels, namely high, medium, or low funniness. So what are the results of the annotation? Let me show this to you. For the first annotation part, the quality, we measured the percentage agreement, and this was around 0.5. So what this, what this means is that if we have two annotators at random, if we choose two annotators at random and ask them to select the two best titles, they will agree on one of those titles and they will disagree um, on the other. So overall, even though, of course, the number could be higher, we still think uh, this is uh, acceptable agreement if at least out of two titles, they choose one common title. Uh, about the humor annotation, we had two rounds of annotation and we measured Cohen's Kappa agreement. Uh, in the first round, we didn't make any guidelines. We didn't make any discussion. We just said, okay, decide for yourself. What is your su subjective feeling, whether this title is funny? Um, and we had a Kappa agreement of 0.4 uh, when we had a three-way annotation in terms of uh, high funniness, uh, medium funniness, or low funniness. And we had 0.5 Kappa agreement if we collapse this into a binary uh, scheme where we only distinguish between whether the title is funny or not. Then after the first round, we made guidelines and we discussed a little bit. So in the second round, we had 0.65 uh, Kappa agreement and three-way annotation and 0.75 agreement, which we also consider as acceptable. Overall, so far, we have like looked at 1,000 titles and uh, from the NLP and machine learning uh, um, conferences and found about 10% of them to be funny, at least to a mild degree. All right, so I outlined to you a few funny titles because that's maybe interesting and not explain why it's funny or not because this is a subjective assessment, but uh, you can assess for yourself whether you think they are funny. First, uh, first uh, funny title would be German's next language model. It's all fun and games until someone annotates video games with a purpose for linguistic annotation. Comparing apples to apple, the effects of stemmers on topic models is the best better. Bayesian statistical model comparison for natural language processing. Nitwit, a data set of novel words in the New York Times. 
and CPR classifier projection regularization for continual learning. And let, let me tell you that the last two are like um, representative for our funny title. So most, most of them has have actually this structure. It's typically some acronym that stands either for the <coughs> either for the data set or for the model. And this acronym is somehow funny or has a, a, a second meaning that relate uh, that's uh, given in the, let's say, in the non-scientific world. Okay, so we address our first. <clears throat> so after the, the annotation, I like the human annotation for quality of the titles and for humorousness, we ask our next question. <clears throat> and this is, which system actually produces the best title. So before I told you we have abstracts and titles and each of them has a score. Each title has a score. How, how good is the title for the abstract? Now what we can do is we know which title comes from which systems. We can just average all the scores, right? And then we get, we get one score for each system. And here, the higher the score, the better. So, those systems that are, have higher scores here are better systems. What you can see is there's a lot of variation. Some models are not so good, like BART CNN. And one model is particularly good. So this is this BART XSUM here, which was fine-tuned on a summarization data set. And what you can even see here is that it beats our human titles. So this is a partial or a preliminary answer to our first research question. Can we get a, uh, an automatic system that's producing better titles than our humans? And here the answer would be at least tentatively yes. But then we look a little bit more into the issue um, and we look at the distribution of best and worst titles. So if we look at the distribution of best titles, we find the 25% of the best titles are actually the human titles. So and this is also the highest number. So if we just look at distribution of titles, we would say, okay, that Ackman titles are the best ones. But now if we look at the titles, it's interesting to see here that um, the human titles um, have also a very large number here or like a relatively large number here. So 13% um, of the worst titles um, are the human titles uh, compared to only 7% um, of, let's say, the, the best, the otherwise best system, BART exam. So there's this discrepancy on the one hand that human titles are often the best titles, but they are also selected frequently as worst titles. So how can we explain this? So we look a little bit into the data and in cases where humans are, the human title is selected as the worst one. And here's, I read it out to you. So the abstract is syntactic analysis of search queries is important for a variety of information retrieval tasks. However, annotated data makes training query analysis models difficult. We propose a simple efficient procedure in which part of speech text are transferred from retrieval results snippets to queries at training time. Unlike previous work, our final model does not require any additional resources at runtime. Compared to a state-of-the-art approach, we achieve more than 20% relative error in the corpus of set text, providing a resource for future work on syntactic query analysis. So now the best title is produced by Bart Exam here. It produces part of speech tagging for efficient syntactic query analysis. And the worst title is selected here as a human title, which reads using search logs to improve query analysis. Now, why has the human title been selected as worst? We think it's because of the word search logs, which does not appear at all in the abstract. So apparently our human annotators, when they read this title, they believed that um, the text generation system was hallucinating. So it's producing a word that is totally irrelevant. And therefore we suspect they uh, label this as the worst title. Good, so now what does it actually mean? So for us, it means that probably the task as we have framed it, namely as an abstract to title generation, um, setting is probably not fully adequate. So probably it means that when humans write titles, they don't only take the abstract into account, but they take their full paper into account. So actually, instead of having abstract to title generation, we should have looked at paper to title generation. But I mean, there are two or there are arguments in our defense. So the first one is if we would consider a, a paper to title generation setup, it would be more difficult for the models because they have to 
<coughs> they have to consider input which is much longer than just the abstract. And on the other hand, also for evaluation, it would be much more difficult because our human evaluators would have to read a full paper, which is much more costly than just reading an abstract. So we think that like, uh, as we have framed it as abstract to, to title generation is an efficient compromise, but on the other hand, it may lead to some misleading results such as that um, maybe uh, the human titles are not the best on average. All right, so I summarize this first part and I summarize it as follows. We have one system, we have identified one system, BART exam, which rivals the human titles. It's probably not yet on par if we just look at the distribution of best titles. And that human titles have been selected worst often indicates that probably abstract is not enough uh, when we want to generate a title. All right, so after the human evaluation, we can we, we finally look at um, automatic evaluation. And we ask ourselves, can we actually use an automatic evaluation metric that replaces uh, the human evaluation setup? And as you may know, in the last few years, a lot of uh, evaluation metrics for text generation have, have been proposed. So like 20 years ago, we had a metric called PLU or Rouge, which was very popular. It's popular until nowadays, but it's actually of low quality. So in the last few years, better metrics have been proposed. They have names such as Mover Score, Bird Score, Bar Score. And we tried them out on our abstract to title generation tasks. So we correlated those metrics with our human assessments and we find actually that the correlation is quite low. So it's below 10%. So this means actually we cannot trust those automatic metrics, unfortunately, so we have to find better ones. So this would also be an avenue for future research. And interesting is if we measure this on the instance level or on the segment level, this basically means you have an abstract and you have 10 titles and you ask the metric which one of those 10 titles is the best, then we have this low correlation uh, to the humans. If we do it on system level, which is easier, uh, system level means we don't ask for one abstract, what is the best title, but we ask which is actually the best system is like BART, BART exam, a better system than GPT-2. Then the models have high correlations with humans. So you see here very high numbers, almost like a perfect correlation, but this is also an easier setup because it aggregates over individual instances. All right, so I summarized this first part on abstract to title um, and um, generation. So we showed that we can annotate the quality and the humorousness of scientific titles with acceptable to good agreement. <clears throat> we provide the first such data sets, we believe, for the scientific domain. We have also trained text generation systems that we just use as black boxes out of the box. Um, and our best system rivals human titles, but probably it's not better. Uh, and the framing is, of course, important, as I pointed out. Is it an abstract to title generation task or is it a paper to title generation task? And finally, we, finally, we have seen that automatic metrics can identify the best systems, but uh, the current metrics cannot identify the best title among several candidates. So in future work, um, of course, we want to improve the metrics, maybe also the systems, but the immediate uh, next thing that we want to try out is humor generation. All right, so this concludes my first part. Now in the second part, I want to talk about poetry generation. And here the insight is recent years, there have been many NLP based poetry generation systems that leverage high quality text generation models, such as the ones that we've seen, for example, RNNs or, or one of the GPT model series. However, most of them hard code stylistic aspects of poetry, such as meter rhyming or alliteration. So basically, uh, the model itself has very little intelligence, and all the intelligence is in the human. So the human is doing micromanaging for the model, and the model is just a puppet of the human. So here's a here are a few examples. So here's one paper from MLP 2020. So what they have is uh, they have two models. They have a poetry generation model and they also have a rhyming model. Uh, so they have two separate models and they tell the model uh, whenever a rhyming word is required. So the human tells the model, now you should rhyme. Then they resort to the rhyming model and they then tell the rhyming model uh, what to do. So basically if AB, AB has to be produced, they tell them the rhyming model, okay, you should now look at the last word of let's say the first line to produce a rhyming word. 
Another such uh, example is, is this one here. So in order to make the model rhyme, what they do is they also, they tell the model, okay, now you should rhyme. And they, they reweight the, the model's probability distribution over tokens. So they say, okay, you should not, now you have to rhyme. And because um, this word should rhyme with another word, uh, you cannot produce certain words. So they exclude certain works from the probability distribution of words that can be produced. Here's yet another paper from 2022. So it's even more complex, even more micromanaging. So there's like discourse level, uh, um, planning, then there's right, how do we generate rhymes, then we also need to polish uh, the model, uh, the, the generated poem for aesthetics, etc. etc. So as we can see, there's a lot of micromanaging and a lot of like, um, um, yeah, uh, intelligence that is transferred from the model to the modeler. So we ask the question, can we actually poetry generation pick up such crucial stylistic patterns from data alone without any hard coding or without any micromanaging? And in this setup, we consider the setup of, or in this context, we consider the setup of style condition poetry generation, where we specify constraints that a poem should satisfy. For example, it should satisfy a certain rhyme scheme, AABB or ABAB. It should satisfy a certain meter, for example, Yambu Stroki. So a meter is basically a sequence of like stressed and unstressed syllables or the alliteration level, which could be high, low or medium. Or we could also look at other things such as the topic, um, which could be love, were. So in our ongoing work, we consider those uh, first three constraints, which can be considered more stylistic constraints rather than uh, like content uh, constraints as uh, the topic would be. <coughs> and now here, here's how it would look like, like in our data. So we have the constraint, we tell the, the model, you should generate a poem that has rhyme scheme A, B, C, B, that has medium at alliteration level and that has yambus as a meter. And then our model could, for example, generate something like this. Now, this is not a model generated poem, it's a human poem. Um, and what you see here, um, it does satisfy the rhyme scheme, for example. So here we have B and B, um, here's, here's a rhyming pair throw and through. It's not a perfect rhyme, but an imperfect rhyme. We also have some alliterations, for example, felt a funeral. So two words that have um, the same initial sound that can also be intervening material or, or treading, treading till. So it's another alliteration. And a meter is yambus here because it's a sequence of, um, so per line, we have a sequence of unstressed and stressed syllables. And this is how our training data looks actually for our models, right? They have this uh, such kind of training data. All right. Um, so now we hypothesize when we come into the modeling aspect, we hypothesize that character or byte level models are better for satisfying um, those constraints better than token level models. Um, especially for those stylistic constraints that we consider such as rhyming meter and alliteration because all of those uh, rhyme uh, all of those um, stylistic constraints have to do with a subword phenomena so rhyming concerns the ending of a word meter concerns the syllables and alliteration con uh, uh, concerns the initial sound of words. So we think that models that are character level are better than token level models for for those constraints. And there's one particular model, uh, which is uh, so-called by T5 model, uh, which has shown uh, that um, it can actually, um, that um, character level models are better for token free um, or for tasks that require word internal phenomena, such as transliteration, lemmatization, and grapheme to phoneme conversion. So we ask whether we can adapt this by T5 model for our style condition poetry generation task. And besides having the distinction between token and character level, there's another distinction, and this is whether models are encoder decoder models. So encoder decoder means the models have an encoder. So for example, in machine translation, you have an input sequence, you first encode this, and then you have the decoder, which then translates it in another language, or whether we have decoder only models. So they, they cannot encode an input sequence, they can only generate text. And 
those encoder decoder models they have different like let's say properties so encoder decoder models um are typically larger they have more capacity maybe they are therefore better for certain tasks and the decoder only models um, they are slimmer and they have fewer parameters because they don't have uh, an encoder and therefore they may be advantageous uh, in certain in certain settings and we think they are advantageous in our setting because our input is just the style constraints which is a very um yeah it's um those are constraints that do not require a lot of uh, bits to uh, encode those constraints. So um, this is like a, let's say an easy constraint. So we think that for our task, decode, decoder only models would perform better. So, and this is, um, this is why we uh, developed a novel metric, uh, a novel text generation model, which is a decoder only model and works at character level and we call it by GPT-5. So how do we train by GT5? We basically use the by T5 model and extract the decoder from by, uh, from by T5. And then we, we pre-train this encoder on English Open Web Text 2. Uh, so we train it on English data and we pre-train it also on German data, CC100 for 50,000 steps. And we have three different models variants. So we have a small model, which has fewer parameter, we have a base model, which has more parameters and a medium model, which has even more parameters. And you can see the performance of the model as they are being trained. So here the perplexity uh, becomes slower over training step. Perplexity is a measure of the model quality, so to speak. And you see that in this case, the largest of our by GD5 models um, performs best as it is, as it is pre-trained. So now after pre-training our models on, on the text that I've just uh, outlined, we fine tune them on poetry data and we find the fine tune them on pseudo quatrains. So those are not real four liners, but they, they, those are pseudo quatrains that consist of any consecutive sequence of four lines. And we extract 660,000 quatrains for English and 1.4 million uh, pseudo quatrains for German. And those uh, pseudo quatrains are automatically annotated for meter rhyme and alliteration. So for each of those quatrains, we give the meter scheme, the rhyme scheme, and the alliteration level. And we do so using either train classifiers or using rules. All right, so now after having pre-trained our models and fine-tuned them on our poetry data, we check how well they perform when they generate po poetry. What we see here is first, we see a distinction between English and German. Um, uh, across those two graphs. On the x-axis, we see the different models, for example, by GT5 small is the smallest model, by GT5 base, by GT5 medium. And we have GPT-2 also here in two different variants, depending on how many parameters it has, then by T5 and MT5. Uh, and now we can look at one of those result curves, for example, let's look at a rhyming, rhyming score. And the numbers here basically mean how good is the model at uh, preserving the rhyme. So the higher the number, the better. If it would have 100% accuracy, it would mean it always satisfies the rhyme scheme. In this case, we have uh, for our best models performances of around 90% for English and German. Now, what we see here is our by GD5 model uh, has like, as I said, a performance slightly below 90% for English and German. If you take the base model, which has more parameters than the small model, it performs on power or slightly worse. If we take the medium model, it performs uh, it performs definitely worse uh, than the small model. So this is a little bit surprising to us that a model that actually seemed to be better at uh, text generation is now performing slightly worse when it comes to the task of uh, producing coherent rhyme, rhymes. But that's slightly... Um, Surprising to us, maybe it has to do with overfitting. So we have to look more closely into this. But then the interesting part is here, we decisively beat the GPT-2 model, which is a token-based model. So that's not character level. So it produces tokens. So we are uh, definitely better here also in German. Um, again, when we have the medium model, uh, it performs worse. Again, the surprising finding. Um, we are also better than the by T5 model, which has this large encoder and which we have like removed from our model. So we are definitely better than this one here. And this holds also for, 
for both English and German. Now, this was only the rhyme, uh, the, the rhyme patterns. We could also look at meter and at alliteration. The pattern is very similar, but as you can see, the models have more problems um, producing correct meter, and they have even more problems uh, producing adequate alliteration level. So to summarize this, what we saw is the token-free transformers Token free means they are character character based transformers perform better than their token based counterparts when it comes to producing coherent poems coherent to the specified stylistic constraints. We also saw that a decoder only model outperforms an encoder decoder transformer and that's probably because we don't need such a large encoder to encode our stylistic constraints. So this means we can discard 75% of our parameters, which is the whole encoder and get a better performance. And we also saw a little bit surprisingly that bigger models do not necessarily perform better. So this could also be related to overfitting. And the most important lesson that we have is that we see that our models can learn stylistic constraints to a good degree. So like rhyming was learned with almost 90% uh, quality without any human micromanaging. And to end this part, I give a few examples of what our model has produced. So here, for example, we required the model to produce high alliteration, ABBA rhyme scheme and a Yambus for the meter. And I read out the poem to you. So it reads the sweet wild strain, the sudden start, which shakes the perfumed altar's flame to make its shrine a sacred name and sing its praise in every heart. So what you can see here, the rhyme scheme is satisfied. So we have start heart, flame name. Uh, alliteration arguably is also satisfied. So we ask for high alliteration. At least there are two cases of alliteration here. We have sudden start and shrine a sacred, which also counts as alliteration in our case. When we look at the Yambus, Yambus is like unstressed, stressed. We also see that uh, this is satisfied at least to uh, to a certain degree or like to a good degree. For example, if we read it, the sweet, so this is uh, unstressed, the sweet, wild, so here maybe it's violated, strain, the sad, then start, so makes sense. Um, another example for German is here we demanded low alliteration, A, B, A, B, and Trocki, so here the the poem is Schweigend stehen die Burgen nieder und die Lüfte sind verhallt und die Trommeln klingen wieder und die Büchsen knallen halt. So again, you see here, nieder wieder, verhalt, halt. Uh, and also Trocki is the opposite of Jambus. So you have uh, stressed and then unstressed. So we have Schweigend stehen die Burgen nieder. So again, makes sense. And but there are of course also cases. So as 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 we have seen, not in every case our model is correct. So there are also cases where it doesn't work. So we have this poem here. Sie war so voll und zart und schlank und war so schlank und jung und schlank und schlank und schlank und schlank und jung und schlank und schlank und schlank. So you see here that the produced poetry, um, yeah, is is not what we. we would expect the model to produce, even though it could even satisfy the constraints. So depending on how you determine whether two words are rhyming, you could even say that the so identical words could also be considered as rhyming. And in this case, the model would even be considered as satisfying the given constraint, but still is not uh, good poetry that has been produced. All right, so this was the second part, uh, poetry generation without human intervention. Let me briefly talk about the third and last part, which is cross-lingual, cross-temporal summarization. So here, our idea is we want to summarize um, texts across time and space. What does time mean? So we want to summarize, let's say, an older language variant into a newer language variant, let's say Shakespeare English into modern English. And with space, we mean different languages. So the summarization is, let's say, from English to German. So, yeah, basically what I said, we summarize historical documents in another language, let's say 18th century English, uh, German to modern English. And of course, if we have older language variants, we know that they differ lexically, they also differ grammatically. And now here we have the additional challenge that we also not only do, do not only consider the same language, but also different languages. 
All right, so what's our approach? Similar as before, we collect data, then we train text generation models on our data. Now this time we have the additional constraint that we need long text generation models. So not all models can deal with long text, but in our case, we have like uh, short stories and fairy tales and they have thousands of tokens and we cannot use, a, let's say a standard model out of the box. We need to use uh, specific models that can deal with long text. And we have human annotation, and of course, after human annotations, as, we, as we've seen in the first topic, we also need uh, automatic evaluation metrics to measure whether our generated summaries are actually high quality. Good. Let's look into data set, which is also an interesting part. So what we do is we have historical German into modern English, and here we have short stories and fairy tales, and historical English into modern uh, German. Here we have only short stories. So which data sources do we look at? We look at Deutsches Textarchiv, which is a basic stock of German language text from the 16th to the early 20th century. We have Wikisource, which is an online digital library, hosts all, all forms of free text and is multilingual. And we query the project Gutenberg, which is a digital archive of cultural works with a focus on older works. An example from uh, example text from DTA that we use, for example, we use uh, from Brüder Grimm, Kinder and Hausmärchen, Märchen, Ludwig Bechstein, Deutsches Märchenbuch, Johann Peter Hebel, Schätzkästlein des Rheinischen Hausfreundes. So this is rather easy to get. Now, the problem is where do we get the English summaries from? So we have the historical German text, but where do we actually get the English summaries from? And our solution is we look at Wikipedia. So what do we do? Uh, for Wikipedia. So we look at each short story or each fairy tale in our data set and we search the English and German Wikipedia where, whether it covers our short story or our fairy tale. So if we have, for example, an English article, we look um, and now we want a summary, right? And Wikipedia provides summaries. So we have to look in a dedicated section which has different names. So Wikipedia is not standardized. So it may have a name such as summary, blood summary, blood, blood synopsis, etc. We look if one of those exists and if it exists, we return the summary. Uh, similarly, if we only find a German article, like in this case of like translating uh, historical German into English, but if we only find a German Wikipedia article, then we look for similar section headings such as Zusammenfassung, Inhalt, Handlung, Inhaltsangabe, and we would translate it automatically, let's say using Google Translate or using DeepL. Okay, so here's here's yet another example. So, for example, from Edgar Allan Poe, we would extract a short uh, a short story from Wikisource. So that contains uh, the short uh, Edgar Allan Poe's short story, um, and then we look to the German and English Wikipedia, and we see okay, actually both of them do contain short summaries of this uh, short short story. Good, in terms of data set statistics, so we collected 300 texts from DTA, uh, Wikisource, Gutenberg for German together with their English um, summaries. And our texts are between 1811 and 1857 with a preference of texts or like higher frequency of texts from the early 19th century. For English, we have a few, uh, we have fewer texts. We only have 250 texts from Wikisource and Gutenberg. The texts are between 1620 and 1920. And the majority of texts is from the late 19th century. So which models are we using and which approach? So first for the approach, uh, we have our short story, let's say in German, we then train a summarizer that translates it into modern English. Uh, then we take from Wikipedia, the English summary, maybe translated using Google Translate or DeepL, and we compare that using an automatic metric. And we, of course, also want to involve human annotators, which we have not yet done so, but so far we have only done automatic evaluation. And the models that we use is a long former. So this is a model that can deal with long text. It's based on the BART model. It can deal with long text, as I said. And we also create our own variant, the MBART LED, uh, which is only a slight variant of the LED that uses instead of the BART model, a multilingual BART model. So it already knows about translation between English and German. 
Good. So then one of the core contributions of, of this setup is also not only to look how good do the models perform, but which um, fine tuning data sets can we fine tune our models on. For example, what we could do is we could fine tune, we could first train our models on standard summarization. Let's say summarize a German text into a short German text or summarize an English text into a short English text. This could be one of the fine tuning tasks that we consider. We can also do the historical uh, time gap where we say, okay, translate Shakespeare English into modern English. That could be another fine tuning task. Or do cross-lingual summarization where we say, okay, summarize a German document, a modern German document into an English German document. And now what we can ask is which of those um, fine tuning tasks help for our final task. And our final task is to summarize the historical documents in one language into um, uh, into a summary in a modern different language. All right, let's look a little bit at evaluation. So as I said, we, we don't have human evaluation so far. We only have automatic evaluation and we use those two evaluation metrics that I briefly mentioned before, bird score, mover score. First, we only train our models um, on German to English summarization from Wikilingua. We see that our metrics say, okay, now the model performs um, performs with a quality of 0.847, whatever that means. Higher is better in any case, so it performs decently, let's say. Then if we add to this uh, uh, a fine-tuning task where we say translate from historical data to modern data, then you see that the performance metrics increase at least for one of the metrics. So for the other one, it says it decreases, but at least for one of the metrics, it increases. And then finally, if we train on our own data set, you see that definitely according to both metrics, the performance of our model become better. And we see a similar pattern for the direction from historical English to modern German. Um, and interesting also, we can do now the same for um, the MBART model that also has seen translation. What you see here is that all the numbers are becoming better. So apparently a model that has seen translation is performing better on this task, which also deals with translating from one language into another. Okay, so basically I'm finished now. Um, just give you two examples of what our model is actually doing, which is also interesting. So let's say we have the fairy tale Das Nusszweiglein from Ludwig Bechstein. Then we have the reference summary from Wikipedia, <clears throat> which says a merchant is traveling and asks his daughter what he should bring them. The first one wants a pearl necklace, the second a diamond ring, the youngest a nut branch. He searches for just that for a long time in vain, vain etc., etc. Then it continues. And if we co compare this to what our model generates, we, uh, our model reads, a merchant wants to bring his daughters a pearl necklace and a finger ring with a demantling stone. On his uh, journey home, he hopes to find a nuts branch. So if you just look at those first two sentences, we can already see, on the one hand, we see the model is actually doing quite, quite well. So this is even beyond our initial expectation. It performs actually quite well. It makes mistakes, of course. For example, um, the diamond ring becomes becomes a finger ring with a demantling stone, whatever this is. So I could even be correct. Maybe that's even correct, but it's definitely different to what the, um, to what the gold summary uh, states. Uh, but the model forgets here the youngest daughter, right? So this just drops. So the model forgets something uh, and then inserts this in the next sentence. So in the next sen sentence, the model says, okay, um, well, the father or the merchant hopes to find only a nuts branch. So still get something correct, but not, not, fully, uh, not, not fully faithful to the original reference summary. If we go in the other direction, historical English to German. So here we have uh, uh, a short story, Seven Toes Ghost by Mary Freeman. So we, I don't read the reference summary here, summary here. I only read the generated summary. Uh, at least the first part, and it says, Der Großvater Benjamin Wellmann ist ein junger Hütehund, der in der Nähe eines alten Bahns lebt. Sein Großvater Benjamin hat einen Welpen, den er nie zuvor geliebt hat, der sich in die Nachbarschaft zurückgekehrt hat. So if you understand German, you see right away that the model is worse now. 
So it makes a lot of mistakes. So the first one is a factual mistake. So it says, or like a, a logical mistake that the grandfather is a dog. Then it has a word that it doesn't translate. Barnes is not translated. Then it has a grammar mistake, sein Großvaters. And then there are more like uh, semantic um, issues in the remaining of the text, but still, um, but still it gets uh, the general message. Now, why historical English to German is worse, we still have to investigate in more depth. One reason could be that we have less data for this direction. As, as, as I said before, we only have 250 stories for this direction, whereas we had above 300 for the other direction. But overall, like this shows, I think we have identified an uh, interesting task for those high quality text generation models, which they still struggle with, um, and they probably struggle with because overall it's it's really a difficult task to translate from a historical uh, language variant into a different modern language variant. So with this, I conclude. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.